everybody. Welcome to the newest episode of Arise with Amber, the podcast. I'm excited again today because I get to have another interview today, and it's a friend that I've gotten to know over the last few years, and it's one of those relationships that probably I wouldn't have had without going through seasons of suffering. So I'm excited for you guys to get to know Casey Mark, and I'm so thankful to have you here. I'm so excited to be here. I know. I was trying to think when... When we first connected, I was going back through all of our Instagram messages, and for some reason, I had thought that I had reached out to you first, but you actually reached out to me Okay. after we lost River, and you just kind of sent, you were just said the sweetest things and sent your condolences, and then we kind of just conversed back and forth on Instagram, and I just remember watching you be the mom that you are. And I will get into all of your story um, a little bit later, but I first just want to hear a little bit about you. Just tell me who Casey is. Tell me about your life growing up. Just introduce everybody to who you are. Yeah, um, I'm Casey, and I'm a mother of two, Noah and Elodie, and I have a third on the way, so I'm just about halfway there, yeah. and I feel like I should be giving birth at this point, <laughs> but um Yeah, I was born in Texas, but I grew up in most of my life in Florida and, um, yeah, came from, it's hard to talk about, you know, family because I, my parents are, are involved Mm -hmm. and, um, but had a, had a very chaotic, um, childhood. So, um, got married at, um, 25, 24, 25, maybe. Okay. Um, it was in 2019 and, uh, right after I'd moved here to Austin and met my husband, my now husband. Okay. And how did you guys meet? Um, I had come to Austin for a job. I'd actually just moved to the Woodlands in Houston to be closer to my sister. Um, and I had just gotten a new job. So I was here in Austin for training and I had a family friend that I was staying with and she's like, Hey, I have a somebody like my my fiance has a best friend that um I want to introduce you to I was like oh I don't know if I trust your yeah <laughs> your judgment but sure um and then we all met up and it was just kind of history from there Aww. I think I moved here like five months later so quick really quick. yeah yeah um so it was it was pretty wild yeah but <laughs> oh so okay do you consider yourself a Texas girl now, or do you still think of Florida as home? No, I think I'm a Texas girl. Okay. Yeah, I love Florida. I love the beach. I love going back to visit. I like that my mom and dad still live there, so we can go visit often, but uh, I I don't think I can move back. Yeah. yeah. We were just talking about the weather and how we're just, we kind of have that fake spring almost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was really cold in the winter and then we get this fake spring where it gets hot for a little bit but now we're kind of in a little cold snap yeah and so yeah. you don't you never know what to wear <laughs> in texas but okay back to as you were growing up so you faced cancer at a young age yes tell me about that yeah so uh we were living in florida at the time and um we had just had like a very traumatic couple of years our house we had lost um, our house in a house fire yeah. um, back in Texas which then made us move kind of full-time to um, to Florida and um, I had just switched schools and was going through a very hard time I was 13 yeah. oh I was actually 12 um, so I was in seventh grade and I was that summer um, I was playing with a friend and I kind of felt my neck and there was this huge orange size uh, bump on my neck. It didn't hurt. It didn't feel anything. And it was just happened all of a sudden. And I uh, went to the doctor and right away they're like, yeah, something's wrong with your thyroid. And again, I was 12. Yeah. So it's like very uncommon. Um, and we lived in a, not a large city with really great hospitals, but started having testing. And I went in for a biopsy. Um, a few weeks later and they, it came back suspicious. And after talking with the doctors, you know, they were like, the chances of you having cancer, thyroid cancer in specific, like we haven't seen that in over 30 years. It's just not, it's just, the statistics are just so low. So the risk of taking out your thyroid and you having to live with that for the rest of your life is probably going to outweigh um, the benefit because 
the likelihood of it being cancer is just not there. Um, it took us a few months and then we ended up doing the surgery. I just, and I, I kept telling my mom, I just know something's wrong. Like something, I just felt it. Yeah. And then I went in for surgery. It ended up being like around eight hours and they removed my full thyroid, which the cancer at that point had kind of spread into some lymph nodes around. Um, and I went into treatments a couple weeks later and this was now 18 years ago. So it was in 2005. So yeah, 18, almost yeah. 19 years ago. So things are so different now of how they treat it. Um, and so there's just, again, wasn't much research. I was a 90 pound child. Yeah. So I was being treated the same way as a 300 pound man. Um, so I ended up going into treatment. Um, I had to be in complete isolation without iPads at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh away from everybody. My parents couldn't be in the room with me for a few days until all the, um, the radioactive iodine got out of my system, which was what was treating the cancer. And then a year later, my scan showed it had come back. And so I went in for another treatment. Um, and that one did a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up having a lot of long-term, um, side effects and, um, I, yeah, I ultimately, you know, throughout the last 10, 15 years, I've had a lot of teeth issues. I were have lost all because I lost my saliva glands, Mm -hmm. um, from the treatment. Um, I had bladder surgeries from it because the, the treatment sat my bladder for too long, causing, um, like breaking my, the walls of my bladder. So that was a very chronic pain condition that I had to deal with a few years later, um, some heart issues. So yeah, it was just, it was a lot. And I think at the time when I was diagnosed, I was so innocent. Like I didn't know much. The internet was just kind of becoming a thing too. And, um, that was a blessing, you know, I, Mm -hmm. I I just felt like I was okay. I have the flu. They're going to treat me. I'm going to be fine. And then as I got older and I started doing my own research and I started, you know, becoming more involved in the cancer community, um, seeing the reality of it, you know, wow, like my chances for secondary cancers are very high. And, um, I did have a, um, false, like, um, relapse situation in 2015 where we almost went in to operate to remove it. And then I went and got a second opinion and, you know, just, it's, it constantly, like, even though I'm cancer free, it's always, you know, there's always something that, um, lots of monitoring. I still go every three months. That's what I was going to ask. How often do you go and just get everything checked? Yeah. Um, blood work every three months while I'm pregnant, um, to just like thyroid stuff, um, every, now I'm at every four weeks. Yeah. So it was every two weeks. Now I'm at every four weeks. So they'll just keep a really close eye on, on my levels. And, <clears throat> and then I go in for a yearly like scan every, mm-hmm. every year. Does cancer run in your family or have you, no. has any, you were the first? Yeah. How did your family navigate that? How did your parents, how were they in watching you have to go through that? Yeah, I mean, kind of back to, and again, I have a relationship now with my my parents, mm-hmm. and um, I think uh, they, I didn't grow up in a very, like, loving home yeah. where they communicated very well or things, yeah. so I didn't really get to witness how that was done. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I do remember that when I was sick, it was like the first time I really felt close to my dad, like he was there, you know? Um, so yeah, it was kind of hard because it was almost like, wow, like I like being sick, you know? Um, of course I did not, but it was just nice that we were all together and like spending time, you know, my mom was the worker and so she took time off and, you know, she did what she could. Um, again, it was like, uh, we were just kind of working off the information we were given yeah. from the doctors. And so she was like, I just want you to get the cancer away. And, yeah. um, so that's what we were doing. And, um, and then she, we ultimately, um, ended up getting a second opinion at MD Anderson and mm-hmm. we flew there. And, um, after my second round of treatment and they were like, we would have never done that. One. Mm. So, you know, but again, it was just, just what the, you learned. It yeah. was just the information she had and they did the best that they could. And, 
we, you know, had um, not a lot of money by any means. And so I think that was like a huge stressor and made me feel like a burden in some ways too, because um, we all know medical bills are not, um, (laughs) not cheap. And so that was really hard as well. And just like watching that and the stress that, you know, put on them afterwards. Um, yeah. Well, praise the Lord that, you know, you're cancer free now and pray that those scans keep, keep going well. And you're, you're involved in the cancer community still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I started Casey helps kids Mm -hmm. when I was, I'd started doing the charity work at 14 and we actually became a 501c3 when I was 15. And what teenager, you know, that's so amazing (laughs) that you, even at that I, young age, we're turning pain into, into purpose. Yeah, I just, I just felt um, like, especially during again that time. Like, I feel, I feel like now there's a lot of organiz. There's so much research. There's social media. Like, you can really get connected in the communities. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really difficult then, and so I felt extremely alone. And I didn't want that to be a thing for others. Mm-hmm. And so, I was just very grateful that my journey was relatively easy, you know, in that moment, like there are much worse yeah. case scenarios. And so I was very aware of that. And I was very grateful. And honestly, it all started, I sent an email out to a teddy bear company. And I don't even think that they responded. But they responded via email, but they responded with sending me 400 teddy bears to my front porch. <laughs> and that is how Casey Helps Kids started. I started by handing out teddy bears two kids all up the East coast. Um, and my mom worked for United airlines, so we would take trips a lot. And so I would just pair it and be like, let's go to the hospital and donate teddy bears too. And yeah, we, we did that for years. Such a blessing. And then ultimately it became a financial assistance and we still have Casey helps kids COVID. And then of course, um, Noah, (laughs) Um, everything we've been through the last few years, um, but mostly COVID, we haven't been able to have the fundraisers that we were able to um, have prior to COVID. We would do fashion shows Mm -hmm. where all of the kids that were fighting cancer would get to come model in them and Mm -hmm. we would sell tickets and then the money would go back to helping with medical bills. So it was a really great fun hobby that I had. And, um, but it was, it was also a mental, like very mentally draining and it was hard because I watched a lot of people suffer and just innocent children. Um, and yeah, I think that it's so hard to like understand why, you know, like they didn't do anything and, um, yeah, just like hard to comprehend. Well, I'll, uh, I'll put, the link down in the description so people can can check it can check it out um but also you know you said with everything with noah so yeah. let's <laughs> shift gears and let's let's go to to little noah so you're married and you guys get pregnant mm-hmm. and you miscarried yes did you miscarry once your first so we actually had three miscarriages okay. um but the one that was like the most traumatic was after we had found the heartbeat, I thought everything was good. And, um, April 1st, I went in and I'll talk about that date because it's a very significant date for me. Yeah. I just got chills. Yeah. April 1st, um, I went in to have just a regular OB appointment and they just couldn't find a heartbeat anymore. So I did have to have like a DNC and, um, I felt with that one, actually Brandon and I broke up. Yeah after that, I felt very guilty. I think a lot because of, I was told I probably couldn't have kids. You know, we didn't have the money to freeze my eggs Mm -hmm. at 13 when I was going through cancer and insurance doesn't pay for, you know, those things. And, um, at the time. And so I, I was aware that it was going to be probably difficult and, I felt just guilty. I just felt like it was my body and like, why, why me, you know? And, um, that sounds like I'm feeling sorry, you know, for myself. And and maybe at the time that's just how I interpreted it. But, um, I just felt a lot of guilt and, um, I think that's a very common feeling. Yeah. I was just angry and, you know, Brandon's this healthy guy that works out twice a day and I'm like, it's not his fault, you know, like my body is supposed to be capable of this. And, And so that was just really hard. And I felt um, like I couldn't mentally get, like I just needed 
time for myself. Mm-hmm. And so we we ended up getting obviously back together. Mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't split up for very yeah. long. But um, I just, I think too, it goes back to, um, I didn't know how to communicate through those hard times. Um, I had never witnessed it. I had never went through it myself. And I didn't have like this model relationship of like, how do you communicate through difficult times mm-hmm. or when you're angry or when you're mad without screaming or yelling or fighting or walking away. And so that was just a really big learning experience. And hey, I'm still working on it. But yeah, <laughs> um, when it's not modeled in front of you, that's hard for you to you're just navigating it on your own as, yeah. as to how to deal with conflict and hurt and grief and pain. Yeah. And it's of course, I don't want to be like that. But that was just kind of all that I knew. I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know how to do it any other way. And so, yeah, for me, walking away was the only thing that I knew how to do. And, um, and so we ultimately, you know, we got back together and we said, okay, we're, we love each other. We're going to make this work. And, um, and then I got pregnant with Noah and I was, um, being closely watched because of the multiple miscarriages. And it was in November that I found out I was pregnant with him, November of 2018. Uh, I was put on Lovenox shots because of my multiple miscarriages. And so he was the first pregnancy that I made it past, you know, the 12 weeks. And I just, after that, I was like, okay, we're good. Like, we're fine. Because I never done that before. And I just didn't have anything else that I was worried about. (laughs) And so we get to uh, our 20 week scan. And all I see is a healthy baby that's jumping around. Of course, I'm no sonographer, but um, everything looks fine to me. Brandon was there with me. Um, And afterwards, you typically see the OB. And so we went back into the waiting room and the office, um, the lady in the front office calls me up and she says, um, Hey, your doctor is in a C-section right now. It's going to be a couple hours. Well, I had to get back to work. Brandon had to get back to work. And I'm like, honestly, I mean, everything to me looks great. If you can just have a nurse call me and tell me we're all good. I'm okay with that. I don't need to, you know, see him today if, if there's no need. And so I went home thinking everything was fine. And my doctor calls me at 630. I was actually in a meeting and Brandon and I were both still working and he calls me and says, uh, Hey, something's wrong with the heart. And I just, I, I just, I just said, I knew it. Hmm. Like I knew I was waiting for the ball to drop. I told him that, you know, and he had been through the miscarriages with me. He had been my OB and He's like, no, this is not your fault. The things like this happen, you know, there's no, no rhyme or reason. Um, and I just, I hung up, like I didn't ask any other questions. Yeah. And so I, and I didn't have a number to call him back on cause he called me back from the office number and it was closed at that time. And, um, the next morning he had told me to call the doctor. He had, he had given me the number and he had told me to call the doctor for the, the MFM So the next morning I call and again, they're like, come in right when we open 830. And I, of course I told Brandon, you know, something's wrong with the heart. And I just start Googling right Mm -hmm. away, like all the things. And I'm just in complete darkness because I have no idea what it could be. I didn't know anything other than that. And again, I'm feeling guilty. I'm feeling like I'm failing again and this is my fault. And so I told Brandon, I said, because I wanted, I didn't want him to have to like deal with the mental load, you know? And I said, just go, go to your meeting in the morning. Um, I probably won't be able to get into the doctor. Um, so just go, I will let you know if I end up getting in. So he did. And I had already called a friend, um, that if I got an appointment, you know, she was going to meet me there. And so I got an appointment. She met me there and it was about two hours of scanning every single thing. And then afterwards the doctor came in and said a whole lot of actually stuff. I don't even remember, but she was writing notes, my friend. Um, but essentially was like, he only has half a heart and, um, I don't have all of the other specific details. You're going to need to get a fetal echo from the cardiologist. 
Um, but what it looks like is hypoplastic left heart. And, um, there's also like, um, some heart failure already in utero. It's probably not likely the baby's going to make it to birth. And, um, if he does, he won't make it to be one. And so he said I could terminate and I had a few more days to decide. And I just remember walking out and my friend, my friend was with me and, um, calling Brandon and saying, Hey, it's not good. I don't actually know what he just said to me, but he did say that, um, I should terminate. And so let me know what you want me to do. I just, again, I felt, of course, that's not what I wanted. And, um, but I just felt like everything was my fault at that point. And so I, um, yeah, I just, he said, absolutely not. Like we've made it this, he's made it this far for a reason. Like we are going to get through this. And I walked upstairs to go see my regular OB because I was seeing this new doctor for the first time. Now he's telling me to terminate and I'm just like, what is happening? And so I went to, um, my OB office and walked in like a crazy person crying and screaming, let me see my, let me see doctor. And, uh, they got me back there with him and he was like, no, you, this baby is going to be okay. Like, mm. you know, cause I, I just said, am I carrying this baby for him to die? Like, I just need you to be honest with me. Don't give me a medical, situ- like, tell me what you think. And so, um, he's like, no, there's, there's hope. Like, you know, we can, we're going to get you through this. And, um, so yeah, I walked out and had to wait four more days to see the cardiologist. So through the weekend, um, and then had the fetal echo and that's when everything was confirmed. And the rest of my pregnancy was, um, a lot of doctor's appointments once or twice a week. We were getting MFM or fetal echo. And ultimately, um, there were three options. It was terminate, which we decided was just not going to be an option. Um, comfort care Mm -hmm. when, when he arrived. So essentially just hospice Mm -hmm. or a surgery, a three stage surgery. And, you know, it was hard because the doctors can tell you what they think is going to happen. And typically in HLHS in a textbook case, it's they're born in the first week of life, they get a very massive open heart surgery. That's very risky. And then they enter into a stage called interstage, which is the stage between first and second surgery. They have their second surgery between four and six months. And then they have their third surgery um, from two to four. Yeah, That's textbook case. Um, but nothing, of course, happens <laughs> happens like that. It's very rare. And so Noah was born um, on July 30th. We ended up moving to Houston to, to give birth to him. And so I moved there at 32 weeks. And um, I just remember I was very calm. Yeah. Like, I remember being very much at peace with everything. And um, again, it was hard for me not to feel guilt mm-hmm. and like that there was some sort of correlation between the cancer and this or, you know, something, but, um, I just, yeah, I was, I just had hope. I I was, I was very, um, at peace. And I remember I have journaled a lot. I remember saying, you know, if I even have 24 hours with him, I'll be so thankful. And, um, now looking back, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. like 24 hours would never be enough. 24 years wouldn't be enough. Yeah. And so it's, you know, now it's this, this little human that um, has such a personality. But that's kind of around the time that I think you and I connected was, well, we lost River in 2019. And then you, you were pregnant around, I guess, 2020. Is that right? It was 2019. So I, 2019. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, the next time we connected after that, he had been born. Yes. And so, because you had told me that that he was in utero and there were some complications and issues. And so I was praying over that. And then I just have followed your journey since. And even though we live in the same town, we don't get to hang out as a lot. Yeah. Um, you're yeah. very busy. But I just witnessed you and everything that you and little Noah went through. And he is truly a little miracle. Yeah. And it's been... we get to talk more about that. But 
So he's born. Does he immediately, when did he have his first open heart surgery? Yeah. So he was born with 25 plus people in the room. Yeah. And they took him away immediately into a, a bed that was right next to me to perform a little procedure that he needed to have in order to keep him alive until they got him to the ICU. They took him to the ICU. And Were you able to hold him at all? Um, for about maybe a minute total, um, after they got him stable. Yeah. And so, um, I actually have the whole video of when my mom was recording when he was born and took him a very long time to cry. So I didn't think he was alive Mm -hmm. when he was born. Um, and then he did start crying after probably a good 45 seconds, Mm -hmm. which felt like an eternity. Um, and you can see in the video, like the doctors looking like there was some concern in their eyes you know they're like stimulate him stimulate him um but then he starts crying they take him to do the procedure and then I got to hold him for probably less than a minute and we got to take a picture and then they took him away into the ICU and then I had to recover before I could go see Mm -hmm. him um and but Brandon could go with him and stay with him and kind of update me with what was going on and so he was hooked up to all the things immediately and he had his first open heart surgery at seven days old. Um, and I'm sorry, eight days old. And he, before his surgery was actually scheduled at seven days and then it got pushed back because there was somebody else that needed something Mm -hmm. that was more critical. And, um, I always was so thankful for that one extra day because, on the seventh day, he looked okay to me again. Is this was my first baby, so to me, I didn't know anything else except what we were going through, you know. And so, of course, I look back at videos. I'm like, oh gosh, his breathing is so fast. Yeah. Um, but to me, then I just was so naive to anything outside of that. And um, but he looked so normal and healthy. But then on the eighth day, when I saw him, he had to have oxygen. He was really struggling. He was purple and. I just knew I was like, this is what he needs. Yeah. Like he needs to have the surgery. And so he went in for surgery. It was probably around a 14 hour day, but between the time they took him and yeah. then brought him back and he was open chested and had over, I don't even know, hundreds of tubes and, yeah. you know, intubated. And it's my seven pound baby laying there when I could literally see his heart beating and, um, yeah, it was, I don't think anything can no. prepare you for that, you know? Um, and you shared some of that on your on your website. Yes. And laughingafterlemons.com. Mm-hmm. .org. .org. And or, no, I'm sorry, you're right. Laughingafterlemons.com. laughingafterlemons.com. Okay. And just those pictures of him. And I, I can imagine as a mom seeing that. Walking through all of this, I mean, you've been through a house fire. You've been through cancer. Now you've been through three miscarriages and now you've been through, now you have a little baby who needs open heart surgery the first week that he's born. What is your, do you have a relationship with God? What does your faith look like? Cause we talked about that peace. You had a certain peace in the hospital, but it's almost like I can imagine you being like, why, why me? Why still me after all of this? Yeah. I, um, in the moment I was, I could feel like that that's where the peace was coming from. I mm-hmm. felt like, okay, it's going to be okay. Um, <clears throat> and then later when we got home, I had a lot of anger yeah. of just the question of, you know, why would a God do this mm-hmm. to a child, to a family, to, you know, and I think, I think I, I lived a um, non-Christian life for so long mm-hmm. and I sinned a lot and I made bad choices. Um, and so I'm like, maybe this is, this is my payback. That's what we do. We blame ourselves and yeah. And I, yeah, I just, it was, it was really tough, but in the moment of the hospital, I, I mean, again, I journaled, I wrote a lot of things down and I, I was reading my Bible every day. I was praying every day. Um, I had a peace and, um, after, so Noah went in for his second open heart. He actually went into like cardiac arrest at at home with me. So we got to go home, um, for not home at an apartment in Houston, but still not in the hospital for uh, about five or six weeks, um, during this interstage period. So we had to chart and take Noah in twice a week for testing, 
Um, Because again, it was just a very fragile period. The mortality rate was high, um, Mm -hmm. especially with a child not being in the hospital. And so um, it was a lot (laughs) and there was a lot of medications and I was just so new to all of this. I think that's what people don't, don't think about whenever you hear or you just see things on social media, you don't see what these people are going through. Like you had to uproot your life. Yeah. And, and it's not how you thought things were going to go. I mean, you're, you're having to live in and out of hospitals and in and out of suitcases and yeah. And, and life in the hospital, you know, you're, you have no control. Like everything was out of my control and I really struggled with that, you know, and you have the, a team, a huge team of people who, um, it was just hard navigating that. And then, you know, just also wanting to be a mom mm-hmm. and um, just not knowing how to help your child. And yeah. so we were at home. Um, I was giving Noah medication and he um, started going into like respiratory, respiratory failure. And I, in my pajamas, barefoot, ran him out. We were in a high rise. So we were on like the 25th floor. So by the time I got down to the, to the floor, I mean, he was purple. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had lost the call to 911 on the elevator and I went up to the valet, um, guy and I'm like, I need to go. And he had known Noah, he had seen us walk back and forth every day. And, um, he just put me in a car that he was about to valet. (laughs) I'm in the front with Noah and we were just going across the street and he drops me off at the ER and we get him to the ER and, um, Brandon was out running an errand at the moment and, uh, he had come to meet us and we didn't leave the hospital, um, that time until about three months later. And Noah ended up needing his second open heart surgery a lot sooner Mm -hmm. than we anticipated. So he was only two and a half months when he went in for his second surgery called the Glen. Again, another 12, 14 hour surgery. Um, and after he got done with that, we, got to see him we go in the room and we had living quarters like in the room so we had a bed with like a little desk and like where we could literally live in and so we were all sitting there we had agreed to have my mom stay the night with Noah because on that first night after surgery there's just not much you can do you can't hold them you can't touch them stimulate them anything um and Bran and I were exhausted and so um we were there to come we we were waiting for him to get out of surgery. We went and saw him and he looked so good. He was nothing like the first time his chest was closed. He had such a great, he was not purple. He was like such a great color. Um, and then all of a sudden things started happening and people were rushing in and I just sat there. We were going to leave. And then I just was like, no, let's wait a minute. Something's going on. And you you don't want to interrupt the team as they're working. And, um, sure enough, Noah was, having a massive internal bleed he was losing blood very quickly they couldn't catch up and so um he ended up coding and they rushed him back to the OR and um opened him back up and um fixed he had a hemothorax and then ultimately ended up having a paralyzed diaphragm and a whole lot of other things but um the doctor came in at 2 a.m 3 a.m that morning and you know said okay I think I've fixed the problem I'm gonna see the night care though just in case and um that was on November 14th of 2019 and so that was a rough surgery yeah. uh and then after that it was like just one thing after another so the next week after that um he was extubated and we thought, you know, okay, this is, he's going to start recovering. And then he ended up coding again that night. And that was the night if I had to have any moment where I was like, God was there. Um, it was that night. Brandon was actually going to fly out at like 4am the next day. Um, cause he travels, you know, a lot and he was still having to work. And I think it was very healthy for him to do that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had to quit my job and, um, So, and Noah was starting to do better. So he was starting to have more like days where, you know, he was progressing. He was still very, very critical. Um, But this particular night, he was um, very agitated and we couldn't source it to anything. And um, we had talked to the doctor and he said, you know, we had kind of gotten into a heated conversation with him. 
And he was like, I, you know, want to intubate him. And um, I said, let's try something else first. And we waited until about 3 a.m. And Noah, I woke up. Uh, I was trying to get some little sleep. You yeah. know, there was two or three nurses in the room trying to help Noah because he was just crying. And uh, I had laid down at that point, gotten about 30, hour, 30 minutes of sleep and woke back up and looked at Noah. And I said, you need to call somebody like he's he was gray, yeah. like not a not a color I'd seen before. Like he was gray. He had no color. And um, they sure enough pulled a gas and they coded him. And the doctor came in and said, I have to let you know, like he's probably not going to make it through this. And like a child, you know, I put the covers over my head and I said, I'm like, da, 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 da. <laughs> like, cause I didn't want to hear yeah. him say that. And Brandon was just in shock and then you know another doctor came up who we were familiar with and he's like I wouldn't want to be in the room during this and we walked out I don't know how but we walked out and we went out to like the main area and uh we went to the family room and again it's like 3 30 in the morning at this point so we got locked out of the ICU (laughs) because there was no one the door locked and every one of the nurses were tending to Noah yeah. and uh, we were in the family room and at this point like Brandon and I were still learning how to like be there for each other yeah. you know because he I know is also doing the best he can I'm doing the best I can and so it's hard to like give each other support when you don't really have much to give no, and you guys are still newly married and, mm-hmm. and just starting this whole new life together. And you've just been thrusted into so much heartache and yeah. uncertainty. And, and what do you say in that moment? Like, literally, somebody had just said that our son was probably not going to make yeah. it. And so we're in this family room, and I just run to the bathroom and start getting sick. And I'm crying, and I'm praying, and... I hear Brandon on in the other side screaming, like, please, God, please help us. Like, um, and like that was the moment that I just like I just got back into the room and I'm like, he's gonna be okay. Like, I know this is like we things are gonna be okay. And um we were locked out of the ICU. I didn't even know. I just couldn't we couldn't see anything, you know, we and God protected you. Yeah, yeah. He and again I like that was a very traumatic situation for us. And I that's like the the moment that I always think back to, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I would have like died of a heart attack, yeah. you know. But there was just a peace, like somebody was saying, God was saying, like, it's gonna be okay. Like I've got him, you know. Um, and so we went back into the room and he was intubated and he was calm and Again, it was a really rough recovery after yeah. that, but we took him home. Um, in March first was the first time we got to bring him back to Austin, and so uh, at that point we had ended up having to get a G tube for him. Yeah. So he was vomiting like fifteen times a day. He was on like forty doses of meds a day. Um, it was constant. Yeah, I watched your videos of, of you of you just having to get out so many different medications and just it's 24 hours a day care of and yeah. now you're a nurse you yeah. know and you're... now it's easier you know and it's still a lot yeah. um because you know now I have a healthy child mm-hmm. that doesn't require and I'm like wow this is a yeah. lot of a lot um but it's I was so accustomed to it I feel like again it's all I knew and so then we came home March 1st to Austin and COVID hits yeah. <laughs> two weeks later um And I had went from this environment of being in the ICU with Noah for nine, on and off nine months to now being at home and all of the stress was on me, all of the pressure, all of the meds, all of the feeds, you know, Brandon's got to work. I'm like, that's how we're living. And it was so much pressure. And I was like, if something happens to him, this is going to be my fault. And what, or, you know, um, does he look off? Like I could always ask somebody because there was always so many other eyes in the room and it was really a a really hard adjustment. Um, and I was dealing with extreme postpartum Mm -hmm. mixed with, I'm sure some PTSD and I got into a really dark place. Um, we had a great neighborhood who was extremely faith, 
faith-based and I would go over to a particular neighbor's house every day, walk Noah over there and, um, you know, just drill her with all yeah. the questions. Like, why is this happening to me? Yeah. Like, no, I, I, I don't like that answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just always, um, having those conversations and, um, she was always willing to take it and tell mm. me what she thought. And, yeah. Um, but I was angry. Yeah. You know, I was so angry, like life this was not what I had envisioned like motherhood to be. And that's so I think I was... it's been adapting to that. Like this looks different. Yeah. That's but... what I was going to ask you is, you know, oftentimes we think about grief and you think about grief as like a death, you know, but it's op- so often you're grieving living, you're grieving the life that you thought you were going to have. And it's not the way, you know, there's a book called, it's not supposed to be this way by Lisa Turkers. And it's people, you can grieve, you know, your living child Mm -hmm. because you're grieving what they're having to go through, what they're having to face, what your life now looks like is not what you ever imagined it would be. So there's postpartum, there's grief, there's anger, there's all of these emotions. Yeah. And with all of that. And I watched, I kind of watched you from afar go through that. And, you know, you talk about women who are super women. I mean, I look at you and just, you are, and you've done it. And it is you going through that is a light for other people to see that it can be done. And so you're home now and you're 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 giving him all these medicines and I know he was really sick for mm-hmm. every day mm-hmm. pretty much. I mean mm-hmm. throwing up 15, tens 15 yeah. times a day. So when does it become evident that he's going to have to he needs a new heart? Like this isn't sustainable. Yeah, so um he I mean he was very sick. We we were cu- I mean, at doctors twice a week for, I don't even know how long. Um, And then of course I find out I'm pregnant. Yes. Very, very surprised um, in the midst of COVID during all of this. And, you know, that was very scary because I didn't know if I could have a healthy baby. Um, And so it was a good distraction because Mm -hmm. I was so busy with Mm -hmm. all of Noah's needs. I really couldn't worry about too much. Um, But Noah, um, it was in 2022 that we, I had kind of known, like we knew his heart was extremely sick. We knew that it was not a textbook case. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was March of 22 when we got like the final, like, okay, he's off the table for the Fontan, which is the third surgery that he needed in order to live. And so, um, that was hard just to have it finalized and for Brandon especially because I I feel like at this point I had always done the doctors typically by myself with Noah um and kind of gave I had to come home mentally exhausted and then give Brandon yeah. the synopsis of what happened and we never really had full answers, you know? And so there would be nights where I'd be like, I just, I don't think he's going to be a candidate for the Fontan, you know? And I never wanted to come off as being like negative about it. And so there was a point where I just like started only giving the facts, mm-hmm. like here's what happened today, nothing new. And for a while it was pretty stable, but the moment that we got that news, like Brandon had a really, really hard time with it because again, I had went through a year of kind of being prepped of like, he's probably not going to have it, but not wanting to tell him because I didn't want to add an extra stressor and Brandon is constantly working, you know? So I just didn't want to like add another thing, um, until it was final. So for him, it was just like this brick wall that had hit him. And for me, I was like, I've been grieving the fun, you know, this not being like, I have known that I guess I just... Again, I don't know. Um, so that was March of 22 when we found out like, okay, transplants are only option. And we ended up having like some insurance issues and like of what center that they were allowing mm-hmm. us to go to, but we got it sorted. And so he was actually listed in July of 22 to be on the list. And of course there's the evaluations and um, that's a lot. Uh, Brandon and I had to go through like over eight hours of learning and um, the diet side of it after transplant, mm-hmm. the, all of the risk and all of the other things that that comes with all of the meds. Um, and, you know, getting getting a new organ is not just a fix. Yeah. Like there's a lot that goes into it and that, you know, they, they want you to know like there is a child that is 
dying, like in order for you to get this organ. And so I appreciated all of that. And, um, it was also really hard. Like I, once that journey started and like, then we were waiting, it was so hard to like pray for a heart. Like, how do you, how do you ask for that? Like you're literally asking for somebody else's loss, you know? So I really struggled with that. Um, we all, we all really struggled with that, you know? And, and, we had a, one situation in December where some friends, um, actually an old coworker had went, um, his son was passing away. And um, that was like the first time it really hit me like, wow, this is so messed up. Yeah. Like, you know, this is, I kind of got to see it. It wasn't a match. The heart was too big and it wasn't the right blood type, but um yeah, I like really watched like and and knowing that that's what we were waiting for. It was hard to like want to continue. Like of course I want to know it's live but it, it was hard to like accept that that was what was going to get us there. And, somebody had to to make that decision. Yeah. And, yeah. Um and so we ended up having to admit Noah in February. He was getting just too sick to stay at home and he was admitted on February 16th of last year of 23 and uh he went downhill really quick yeah. and um at this point you know I'm very far away from my faith I feel like mm-hmm. I'm 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 just um very detached I was probably handling all of my anxiety and stress in all the wrong ways. Mm -hmm. I was in fight or flight mode and I just was putting one foot in front of the other to get Noah and you know what he needed. Um, And so we were impatient. Noah's, you know, just declining. And um, probably a couple weeks later, Brandon and I had the conversation, like maybe we should just bring him home. Like let's, you know, this is, we're having to watch him literally suffer. Like, is this what he would want, you know? Um, And then we got the call. Like, was that right around the time you guys were thinking about bringing him home? It was about within the, within the two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, and you got the call on April, the the night before March 31st. Yeah. Yeah. We had, it was really crazy because um, Brandon and I weren't, I mean, we were constantly switching spots in the hospital. And then my mom had moved in to also be an extra filler mm-hmm, into mm-hmm. the hospital shift. And so going back and forth to Dell and then, you know, Brandon's still traveling for work. And then we have Elodie, yeah. you know, and all of this. And um, it was so hard to spend any time together. So Brandon and I were like, let's have a weekend where we we get a hotel right next to the hospital and we'll set up sitters. We had people, of course, that loved mm-hmm. Noah. We had Noah's nurse that was still coming and, and staying at the hospital. Um, we had family friends that were sitting with Noah. And so we we're like, let's set up a weekend where we can get some rest, spend some time together because we were struggling. Yeah. Our marriage was struggling I at was that ask point. about your marriage, yes. Yeah, it was, it was hard because we were both struggling in our own ways. And again, I, um, I just couldn't give much and he couldn't give much either. Yeah. And I knew we were just surviving at that point. Um, and I thought, I mean, it was just selfish of me to like expect him to like comfort me. So I, yeah, we just, we were, but we were angry and we were just dealing it with, with it in our own Grieving ways. in your own ways. Yeah. yeah. And so we had just left the hospital that Friday and we had um, every other Friday we had like a meeting conference with all of the staff at the hospital, like how's things going, what's going on medical wise And we had kind of had a pretty, um, again, it's hard to stay calm when like you're watching your child not do well. And he had that day specifically, he had started vomiting a lot more and he was not being fed. He was just TPN and lipids. So all IV nutrition and still puking around 20 times a day. And so, 
Um, and then he was having like severe leg pains. I mean, he just didn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. And it was just so wild how quick it turned. Um, and so we had, we'd had a meeting with the team and we had left the hospital and we were in traffic, five o'clock traffic, cause we had reservations to go to dinner. And, uh, we had left Noah with the nurse, uh, with our nurse, like sitter and we're in the car and the doctor calls me. And I just, I talked to the doctor occasionally, so, and she wasn't able to be in that meeting. So I assumed, okay, she's calling to see how the meeting went. Mm -hmm. You know, she was busy and she's catching up. So I answered the phone like, hey, like, we're heading to dinner, you know, like just yeah, my chatty self. <laughs> and she's like, okay, so you're driving? You need to pull over. And I said, I just looked at Brandon. And I mean, it was just so wild that we were uh, together yeah. because we were never together in the stage of yeah. our life. And here we are in the car together when we get the call. And Elodie had actually went to my sister's house in Houston. My parents had taken her there for the weekend. Um, the dogs were in boarding because we had planned this weekend of like, let's just spend some time together. And then we get the call. And I knew it was nothing bad by the way, she, the tone in her voice. And she's like, we have, we have an offer. And I just was like, okay. It, 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 okay. Yeah. You know, and it, there was some, there was some extra things. Um, and, you know, we, there was some extra complications and uh, that we had to discuss but ultimately, I, I ended up pulling over into a random neighborhood in downtown Austin. And I got out of the car and I said, I just need you to, to tell me, like, would you put this heart in your in your son or daughter? And she's like, yeah, I would. I'm like, OK, I don't have any other questions. And I so <laughs> I like can't even imagine. I can't imagine, you know, you've gone through so much. And, and I remember talking to you, like you didn't know when it was going to happen or it, or if yeah. he was going to make it before it happened. Yeah. And then just to get that call and everything is in line, everything's in place. Your, your daughter's gone. You guys are together. Like, it's just like the it, perfect scenario. It really was. Yeah. It was so wild because all of those things, like, and out of all the times that we got the call, it was just at the perfect time. And it, it was the perfect heart, you know, um, it was big mm -hmm. and no one needed that um the surgery day it was about an 18 hour and is this the next day, day? like the you go in day. immediately so we went in um so they had to fly to get the heart I don't know any details yet but um he went back around 7 a.m they're having to coordinate everything so once the flights like once they're in flight um because there's so many things that could happen then yeah. like I've seen stories from families where the plane doesn't operate mm -hmm. and just so many things had to go right. And they did. And, um, Noah got out around 1 AM, 1 30 AM the next morning. And, um, yeah, the, the surgeon, he's a man of few words, mm -hmm. but he came in and he said, um, wow, I've never seen a child have so many collaterals that mm -hmm. like just him being in such severe heart failure for so long, he had built up all these collaterals and he's like, um, the heart wasn't taking it at first. So, and then, you know, but we had no idea during, you know, the, the actual surgery that any of this was happening, but he's like, he's going to need some extra time and, um, it's going to be a slow recovery for him. And for us, slow recovery meant months mm -hmm. because we had been through, <laughs> the other two surgeries and, um, they were so tough, you know, and even after recovery, they're so fragile and sick, mm -hmm. but transplant recovery is very different <laughs> because their body is getting this perfect heart, you know, they're this new organ and we were discharged 12 days later. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, um, yeah, Noah just, I mean, it's Noah's had a slower recovery. We've had some some things that have happened um like he's got kidney disease now you know there's just some things but he is a vivacious four-year-old who keeps me on my toes and um yeah it's just wild and so it's just 
everything seemed to take okay. His body accepted. There's yeah. no rejection. He's is he sick anymore? Like throwing up wise or we have days. Yeah, yeah. So he is fully tube fed. He's yeah. starting to eat more by mouth. Um, but he's. I mean, I, I can't compare a different the two. Child, you know, yeah. before transplant and after, it's just not comparable. Um, I'm so thankful. Like we've just made so much progress. Um, we do go back in for a heart cath on April 1st, which is, will be his one year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that was also the day I was supposed to have my anatomy scan for this baby. And I was like, I talked to my doctor. I'm like, okay, so let me tell you, April 1st is the day. Well, and that was the day that you miscarried. Miscarried. Yes. So, and I just, that is. Just and it's the, also the day that we got the official diagnosis of Noah's HLHS. I just, God yeah. is just in the business of redeeming days. Yeah. And it's like where there's one day of sorrow, he will redeem it for something wonderful. And I, just, I don't even have words for that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's pretty wild. Um, so, and I didn't actually know that because I didn't pay attention mm-hmm. to those things until I started looking back and I was like, April 1st, yeah. you know, and now of course, April 1st is like such a important day in yeah. our lives. Um, but I also do want to talk about like the day that it happened Mm -hmm. um it was so hard to think about what was going on on the other side you know but so important like these people are literally making this decision I don't know who they are um but we I remember Brandon and I sitting at Olive Garden to go grab a bite to eat because we were going to shower and grab a change of clothes and um the next day after after transplant day and we just were like another family is just they're you know they're probably at home like what am I doing and like it was hard to be excited yeah for our son you know and and knowing that like on the other side someone is just like how do you I guess for me like I look at you and I have another really good friend that lost her son and like I'm like how are you living you know and I know I'm sure you hear that all the time it's like well because you know yeah, I have to. Um, when I look at women like you doing the same, navigating <laughs> all of the stuff that you've gone through day in and day out, and and I don't know what's harder, losing losing your child or having to watch them suffer for so long every single day, not knowing yeah. if they're going to make it through surgeries, and and uh, yeah, yeah. I just I like. Um, I for so long was having like a lot of anticipatory grief, yeah. like, okay, I need to prepare for the day. And so I still, I still think about that because transplant by any, like, it's not a cure for ever. Yeah. There's a lot of complications. The average lifespan is nine years mm-hmm. post transplant. And if we add nine years, like it will only be 11. Yeah. That's not a full life. But he is he is way exceeded every doctor's yes, yes. words and thoughts that that they thought. But it's hard not to, to get in yeah, your head, you know. And um, but I know it's possible, and I know like I I see you, and I'm always amazed by you know just like the outlook that you have and the peace that you have, and um, I think I look at all of the other things that we've been through, and it's like, well. I don't know how I made it through that. And there's just, you know, I think think that's just a testament to the Lord has brought you through it and he will continue to bring you through it. But it brings me comfort sitting on the other side, getting to see somebody else get that miracle. Yeah. You know, in that, in the hardest decision of our lives that gave someone else a chance. And I've gotten to meet the recipient of, of River's kidney and she's happy and she's healthy. And it's like, that's good, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, I know like don- the donor privacy between donor and recipient is very, yeah. you know, it's very private, but are you looking to like, do you think they want to meet you guys or are you looking to meet them if, if at all possible? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I don't know anything yeah. like, at all. I don't so know. So you haven't gotten a letter of, of anything or anything yet? Nothing. Okay. Um, cause it hasn't technically like been a year. Okay. So I guess that's. Maybe that's the time. Yeah. That is. That is the time on our side. Mm -hmm. I know that we're not able to send a letter for them or to them. Um, 
I have my letter written. That's right. We have to do it first. I think is that right? I think I think, I think the you people have to who, give the okay. We first. have to give the okay. Okay, because I remember doing that first, and then I was just waiting in such anticipation on the other end. Like yeah. I cannot wait to get this letter. Like please write me back. Yeah, because you don't know if they're going to want to. Right, and I think that is the hardest thing. Is like. I, I've had to, it's taken me a really long time. I've thought every single day about like, what am I going to say? Like yeah. I have so many things I want to say, you know, transplant has given us freedom. Like we've gotten to travel and every single place we go, we collect a postcard for the donor family. Oh. And, um, like, you know, it's just, it wouldn't be possible without them. And, uh, Noah just, you know, he doesn't understand yet, but I had told him I'm writing a letter for, you know, your heart, like, um, a little boy or girl went to heaven and like, they decide, like his family decided to give you that heart. And, you know, Noah said, well, that was so nice (laughs) (laughs) because (laughs) he's four, but I said, you know, that was so, that was so nice. And so I just want him to know, like, like it was such a sacrifice and, um, my letter is, is almost done I have a few more things to add but we will be handing it over on April 1st when Noah's in his calf and so I really hope that they want to meet and um at least have some communication um I'm gonna pray about that yeah it's just but I also need to like be okay with oh sorry I have to be okay with if they don't right and um I don't know. And not to get your hopes up because it was, it was hard. I remember when we received, we got our, ours in the mail and I was thinking, I wrote like this long heartfelt thing and I got back a card and it, it wasn't, I had high expectations and I, I learned now don't do, don't do that. Don't (laughs) Don't do that. that. And I've met the woman and she's amazing. She's Spanish speaking. So it was very short and to the point. And I was like, I want to know more. I want to know more. But now we've gotten to meet and talk. So just don't have high expectations, yeah. but yeah. just be hopeful yeah. and, and grateful. And, and I hope that they do respond because I think it just would be yeah. the sweetest thing for you to be able to have that relationship yeah. with it's their been, family. It's been, I mean, even writing the letter, you know, it's like, I, I think about like, how do I sit here and talk about this whole year that we've had of just joy mm. and like, um, travels and experiences that like we would have never gotten you know and they've been grieving and so I've I've tried to like it's been hard to know yeah like but but that's why they did it you know and and then you go back and forth it's really a it's a it's a juggle Um, well I mean I can't speak for them but I will tell you I like she sent me a picture of her on the beach the other day and she she was wearing a live like rive shirt and so I am joyful that she is healthy and she is yeah. getting to travel and do all the things that she wasn't getting to do. Yeah. So I hope that they'll feel that way too. And, and they did make that decision. So somebody else could have life. Yeah. And so feel, feel good about that and, and let them know that like, we're getting to do all of these things yeah. because of your sweet baby, yeah. you know, because of the decision that you made. So I would want to hear all the things that you were doing if it was my <laughs> mine. but okay. Well, we have, we probably have like maybe 10 or 12 more minutes, but so what does life look like right now for you guys? How is, how is Noah? How is Elodie? How is this little baby? Like yeah. what is all going on in your life right now? So we just moved in October. So it's just been like a whirlwind. And then, you know, Brandon and I were, I wouldn't say like the door had ever been closed on having more babies, mm-hmm. but I feel like it was always like pregnancy is being pregnant with Elodie was still very stressful. Like I was convinced she was a heart baby mm-hmm. until she got here and I could see her and that she was healthy. Um, and so it was always just kind of scary to think about having another. And then, you know, Noah's Noah's still been pretty sick up until around December, mm-hmm. like is when he really took a turn of like just being doing amazing. Um, and, So we moved and uh, Elodie is three now and she is a hot mess. Um, Very sassy. I don't know where (laughs) she gets it from. And uh, and then Noah is also very witty. He knows way too much for a four year old and um, is quite hilarious. But 
Uh, they are currently in school right now. They go just like three days a week and give me a little bit of a break and give yeah. them some normalcy and some routine. Um, and then I am pregnant. And so um, I am almost halfway. So I have my 20 week scan next week. But we had a fetal echo. Everything looks good. And so good. Um, the anatomy scan is next week. And I've just I've I've had a lot of anxiety. Um I feel like because we've gotten, we've had so many blessings, yeah. you know, and life is looking normal. I'm so used to the chaos, like from childhood mm-hmm. to now, I've, I've just always been used to the chaos and the meds and the feeds and the appointments and all of the things, you know, whether it be with Noah or myself or, and so things have like started to calm down and it's made me feel kind of uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um and it's it's a brought in a lot of like worries that the shoe is going to drop. Um, so yeah, yeah, trying to get through that. And we have picked a church. Like we've been, you know, really getting involved with that yeah. with the kids, and that's been awesome. Um, have you and Brandon been able to kind of reconnect and and have a moment to breathe and actually like enjoy each other and spend time together, or do things still? feel kind of I know you said it's not chaotic but are are, with you waiting for the shoe to drop have you been able to enjoy each other yeah yeah I mean I think we communicate I mean it's been five years Mm -hmm. that we've been going through like this since finding out about Noah in utero Mm -hmm. to now Mm -hmm. um we've learned how to communicate and like what we need and when yeah. and through st- stressful situations and kind of like not having the expectation from yeah. the, one another of like, okay, like this is just how they are in stressful situations and like accepting that. And, um, but yeah, we have, like, we've been able to, I feel like get out a bit more, mm-hmm. you know, again, Noah's gotten a lot better. So I feel like we can occasionally get away mm-hmm. or, um, not get away away, but like go out to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Things that, you, things, things that seem that so were, normal. Yeah. yeah. Things that we just really were never able to do. Um, but also just like have more conversations and um, be more open about everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like we've grown a lot in that aspect. And, um, and just, you know, the kids are getting older. Like they watch us mm-hmm. and like really setting um, the foundation of like how do we want to – to raise our children mm-hmm. because that has impacted Brandon and I so much yeah. as we, you know, in, in a lot of ways yeah. as we have gotten um, older and um, there's a lot of things I want to do different. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. What, what were some things that were helpful when you guys were going through this season and what were some things that might've not been so helpful that either people said or people did like what, what helped you the most in your season that you were going through? Yeah. Um, helpful was, I mean, so we don't have family mm-hmm. here, um, like in the area. And so my parents live in Florida and um, people just showing up yeah. and not showing up to get more information or talk about what's going on, just showing up to just sit there and yeah. like listen or help with something you know and um I feel like a lot of times and even I'm I'm guilty of doing this like hey how can I help you Mm -hmm. like no I'm coming over yeah you tell like you know leave a load of laundry for me like kind of just showing up um that was like the most helpful because it was I was terrible asking for help and there was just no way we were we could do it all on our own yeah. you know um, and you kind of don't know what you need you just you just yeah somebody's it, like what do you need I don't know yeah I don't know and everything I don't is think. everything is helpful you know yeah. any help is help and it's helpful but thinking about it even was difficult yeah. in that moment you know um because also I'm just a person I didn't want to ask for help I wanted to do it all yeah um and then not helpful <sighs> the comparison stories yes. the um Oh, I have a cousin who had a heart. I totally understand what you're going through. It makes you want to shut down and not talk to anybody. Yeah. Um, 
And, and it is so hard because it does come from a good place yes. that it's like everybody's each individual journey is their own. Yeah. And nothing is, is exactly alike. Yeah. So that, that was, that was really hard. Cause as I, you know, again, was a new mom, I wanted to like get out and meet new other moms and have play dates. Um, but I really struggled with connecting and mm-hmm. like without having to go through those conversations, mm-hmm. Um, because I would instantly just be like, regret, like getting out and doing anything because it would, it was just so hard to hear, you know, like, wow, like they think that, you know, that's what this is. And it's just so far from that. Um, yeah, those are, I mean, I think just, what would you say to somebody, say there's a mother pregnant right now and she gets that diagnosis from the doctor that her there's something wrong with her baby's heart what would you say going through all everything that you've gone through everything you've seen what would you say to her what would you say to that family how would you encourage them through what they might be about to face yeah um I I mean there's just there's hope Mm -hmm. I I just I remember um I'm a planner I wanted to see, I want to, I want to know the future, you know, like, which was always, that's so hard. Put your, put your trust in God, you know, like you, you don't know the future, but, um, I'm a control freak. I want to know. And in the textbook case, you know, you have one surgery, you have the next. And, and so I had my mindset that that was going to happen. And what I learned really quickly after the second surgery was that, um, it truly is, day by day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's moment by moment, Mm -hmm. second by second. Um, and not thinking too far into the future, like really, really just being in that moment, um, was like the best advice that I can give any mom that's about to go through a journey. That's just so uncertain, you know, it's just, there's so much uncertainty to it. Um, and that there's just hope. Like I remember being so hopeless and, and, many times there were so many times in our journey where I was like he's just not like I don't I don't think he's gonna I don't think we're all gonna make it through this and if and if he makes it through this I don't think I'm gonna make it through this Mm -hmm. and or our marriage is gonna make it through this and um but just knowing that you know there is hope like no matter what there's hope um I love that through all of it yeah Yeah. I just love you I just think you are incredible and I know you you haven't obviously done it all on your own you've had you've had help you've had the yes. Lord give you strength because yeah. no human could go through what you guys have gone through and still come out you're you're you were being refined and yeah. we don't want to hear that we don't want to hear that the that the things of this life are meant to refine us and purify us and make us stronger you think why do I have to go through all that right. like can I just and why does my child have to go through all that yeah you know and I just I just see your story and I can see God moving in all those places. Yep. And I'm just grateful to have you here. And thank yep. you for coming and sitting Absolutely. with me. Tell, um, tell us all how we can find you, how we can read your blog, where where you are, so they can catch up on Noah and Elodie and this little one. Yes. Um, on Instagram, uh, at Laughing After Lemons. That's where I usually post the most. Um, I do have a blog um, that typically I still trying to figure out what we're doing with it. You know, mm-hmm. now that life is kind of normal. Um, and that's laughingafterlemons.com. And then um, if you want to learn more about the organization, that is khkidz.org. Okay, I'll put, I'll put all that <laughs> down in the description. Well, thank you guys for being with us. And thank you for um, listening and getting to, getting to know Casey. And gosh, there's so many organizations that are helpful for so many. So I want you all to check out Casey's organization. And also just organ donation is so important. And it, it takes literally signing up just like that and you can help to save eight lives if you ever have to make that decision for yourself or somebody else you can help to become someone else's miracle you can be a living donor there's so many different ways to be a donor so i'll put all that information on the screen as well i will see you next time you guys are chosen Bye.